think so. Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us today. We hope you enjoyed the XX report uh, that we released on Monday. Huge congratulations to Teresa and Sarah, who led the research on such an impactful report. And thanks to the over 400 individuals who actually took the survey for us over the last six months. Um, we appreciate your time and your input on the, on the topic. We wanted to follow up um, on the report with a conversation with a few women in the space and all of you. We only have half an hour, so we want to jump right in. Uh, my name is Hallie Teko, and I'm a managing director at Rock Health. Today, I am joined by Jennifer Chung. Can you wave, Jennifer? <laughs> Hi there. She's the co-founder and CEO of Kinsights. She went to Stanford undergrad and has an MBA from Harvard Business School. She worked at CNET and Genentech before helping to start Kinsights. Donna Cryer, who is the president and CEO of the Global Liver Institute. She went to Harvard undergrad and got her JD from Georgetown. She's had a long career in the policy and nonprofit world in DC. And Hello. Julie, <laughs> and Julie uh, Papanik, who is a principal at Canaan Partners. Julie went to Yale undergrad and got her MBA from Stanford Business School. She also worked at Genentech before moving over to the investor side. All Hi, right. everyone. Um, thank you guys for joining us. Um, for all of you at home or at your office, we do want to hear your thoughts and your questions. So on the top right of your screen, um, there should be a 3x3 three three grid that you can hover over and click the Q&A icon. Please give us your questions and thoughts throughout the entire dialogue, and we're going to save the last 10 to 15 minutes to hear from you all. You can also use the hashtag WeCanDoBetter um, on Twitter for any thoughts that you guys have or things that you want to share on online. All right, let's get started. Um, I'm going to pick on Jennifer first uh, for our first question. So in our research, we found that only 6% of funded digital health CEOs are women, and only 10% of VC partners are women. Do you think it's harder for women to receive venture funding, and if so, why? Well, you know, the numbers seem to say that, yes, it, it's certainly harder, and I think there are a lot of um, complex dynamics at play here. You know, I think one is kind of pattern recognition, you know, which can be very faulty. So if you're an entrepreneur who looks, feels, and acts like the CEO of another successful company um, that you as an investor has funded before, you're just more willing to take that leap of faith. And so if you're a male, you certainly benefit from this a lot more than a woman. There just isn't enough volume sort of a female, of female entrepreneurs who've been funded to make this sort of work. Mm -hmm. um, and another thing that sort of comes into play is there have just been fewer women in tech traditionally, so there aren't as many CEOs who can sort of position themselves as second or third time founders with a track record. Um, so it means that most female CEOs have had fewer touch points sort of in the startup ecosystem um, by the time they go out to receive funding. Um, so I think that can be very challenging. And the last one that I think is really the toughest to tackle is thinking about social dynamics. You know, I see a lot of male CEOs and investors who really blend their personal and professional lives all the time. They build these deep, really integrated networks well outside of the workplace. And so as a woman, if you're missing out on sort of 80% of those interactions, it can just really be tougher to get integrated into those inner circles um, where those relationships and friendships really get built. And, you know, 80% of work happens outside of the workplace. Um, and I think that is a very, very difficult challenge for women. Yeah, especially in an industry where your network and your relationships is, is really everything. Yep. Um, one of the other things that I, I saw in um, research, not rock health research, was that men are more likely to be uh, given a chance early on and people will believe in what they are going to achieve, whereas women are mm -hmm. valued based on what they already have achieved. So a 20, yeah. you know, a 19-year-old Mark Zuckerberg, um, people are more willing to take a risk on him, whereas a, you know, female version of that um, would, they would ask questions like, well, what have you done so far? Why are you qualified to do this? Um, do you think that that you've seen that? Do you think that's accurate? Yeah, I think there's a bit of that, and I think that does fall into sort of the pattern recognition problem, right? When you see someone like Mark Zuckerberg go out a on a limb and try something and to succeed, when you see someone else who kind of reminds you of him, you know, it's easier to take that leap of faith. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think there aren't enough women who've give, been given the opportunity to do that or women who've put themselves in that position um, mm -hmm. to then, again, start educating sort of investors in the tech community that, you know, women are just as capable and sort of yeah. don't need to be measured on sort of actual sort of the same metrics. 
Well, and, and the irony of it is one of the most successful uh, companies built in the digital health space, Epic, uh, is run by a woman, but she's uh, very under the radar, and she's not yeah. putting herself out there um, as a role model. I think she'd rather kind of uh, be kept to herself, and she doesn't like press, and she doesn't like speaking at things. Um, Julie, as a VC, uh, what has been your experience in getting pitched by women founders, and why do you think that they're receiving less funding than their male counterparts? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so I think a, a little bit is about the warm intro. The, to go back to the social dynamics associated with getting funded um, and pattern rec recognition, I think part of where there's so much uncertainty related to a business, a product, or a service is who is the team? What do I know about them? What do I know about their background? What do I know about their potential? And I think that we see a lot of warm introductions from men. Um, and I think that does have to do with that social dynamic. The fact that we have female partners, two of them, I'm a principal, I invest for our firm, and I, I know plenty of women who have science, math, engineering backgrounds. It, it actually isn't an issue, in my opinion, in my network, but I think that's also because maybe I came from there. And so when a woman comes and talks to me about what she wants to do, it's a lot easier for me to talk to her and also understand that if she makes a self-deprecating comment, it's not actually because she's insecure, it's actually just sometimes how women talk to each other to be vulnerable and approachable. Um, and so th there is that dynamic of not only networking to get the warm intro, I think getting the intro from the right investor to another investor who they have co-invested with in the past, um, but also the language that people use. I, I will admit that I often see men selling ahead of what they actually have produced. Mm -hmm. They sell vision. Mm -hmm. They sell concept, and they sell it pretty aggressively. Mm -hmm. um, it's a lot more of like, yeah, I met that number, and yes, my growth rate looks like a hockey stick. With this very small sample, they won't say that. They'll mm -hmm. just say, like, mm -hmm. my, my curve looks <laughs> phenomenal, <laughs> and you should back me because I'm amazing. And yeah. it, it's a very different dynamic. You're saying um, female entrepreneurs are more modest. <laughs> not all of them. I, I would say yeah. that we have some very... <laughs> Um, assertive and driving female CEOs in our portfolio, I just sometimes see it more for first-time CEOs who are women. Mm -hmm. and, and quick yes or no question, do you think that when women partners bring a female founder to the Monday partner meetings with all men, um, do the, the men in the room look at that female partner like, are you just bringing this person in because they're a woman? Is there something about being a female partner where you almost don't want to be tagged as just investing in women. You know, I, I actually don't think about it. Uh, I, I think that we're kind of at the point in our firm that we don't have that issue. I, I'm lucky in the yeah. sense that I work at a firm with a lot of women. Like, both of our analysts are women. You know, I'm a woman. We have two women GPs. We back a lot of women. So, I don't know. I think we might be an exception. I don't sit in a room with just men. I do mm -hmm. on boards. Um, but... Uh, less so in our Monday meetings. I mm -hmm. could see that happening, but I, I guess I don't think anyone would think anything if I backed like four women. I, as long as they do well. Yeah, <coughs> yeah show me the money. Show all me right. the money. <laughs> <laughs> all right, Donna, um, I think we would all agree that you've made it to the top. Can you tell us kind of how you broke through that uh, proverbial glass ceiling and got to where you are today, especially given some of the health experiences that you've had? Sure. You know, these days I think in terms of um, blog post titles. And so if this were a blog post, <laughs> if this were a blog post, I would entitle it On Brokenness and Blue Oceans. So um, on brokenness because um, my path has been like many other women that I've spoken with um, who have achieved sort of executive positions because we've taken on practices or divisions or even entire organizations that are in crisis, that are in some cases utter messes. And so um, the 
the, the boards or the bosses in those situations are often like, well, we'll give it to the woman because, you know, it's already a mess. So, but it's an opportunity to shine. It's an opportunity to turn around and show some really great um, results that you can stand on in the future. And then also build your confidence. If you can do it with that, my goodness, what could you do with a, you know, a healthy organization or resource or anything like that? And so um, it takes a, uh, some risks. Uh, tolerance to be able to do that, but I think there's incredible opportunity. Mm -hmm. um, then the second part on the blue oceans is another area where many women go, and is certainly in my experience now, having created uh, the Global Liver Institute, but also my help, my past healthcare consulting company, um, is to create something new. So not only is there no glass ceiling, there's no roof. Um, so there is no limit to what you can create when you really uh, look in the landscape, analyze it closely, and, uh, and find opportunities that aren't being served well and create and build an entirely new market. And so I think that those are you know, the ways that I've sort of found, you know, up, over, around, through um, glass ceilings is to sort of ignore them uh, entirely in, in creative um, and, uh, you know, sometimes bold ways. Great. Um, and before I move on to the next question, I just wanted to remind everyone to submit your questions. Um, there should be a Q&A box somewhere on your screen uh, or tweet them, but um, we'll, we'll get to them in just a few minutes. All right, so many of you guys have heard of what they call the mommy tax, where women get penalized for having children, adopting children, having stepchildren, or they're put on what they call a mommy track, where they get flexible hours, but at the cost of having fewer opportunities for advancement. Uh, we have two moms in the group, uh, Jennifer and Donna. You guys are both mothers and executives. What are your thoughts on this? You know, I have a... I have a four-year-old son. I think initially women feel sort of a lot of pressure in that that early messaging when they get pregnant or they have a child, sort of if you start reducing travel or you take a long maternity leave, you know, it can be interpreted as a signal that you might be heading sort of on the mommy track. Um, but I'd love to see a better division of labor. I think we can make this less of a gender issue. It'd be great to see more men taking a long paternity leave, yeah. right, so that they have the opportunity to be the default caregiver early on. And I think structurally there's a lot that we can do to make working parent a lot easier, companies having childcare, schools and daycares really having schedules that actually work for working parents. Um, but you know, I, I've seen a lot of companies, and I know we're going to talk about Genentech in a bit, but just really make an effort to make this sort of a non-issue or a close to a non-issue um, for, for working mothers. Mm -hmm. So I approached uh, or have arrived at motherhood uh, and sort of mommyhood in, in a sort of an odd fashion. Um, I really am in charge of creating family for, for both sides of the family, my own and, and, and my husband's, but that's through uh, going through five years of, of infertility and some may say successfully because I don't have a natural child and so it's exciting when people even perceive me as a mother and maybe that's because of the numbers of, of, uh, of you know, children and young adults from age, you know, three to twenty-three, who are running constantly through my house and my life. Um, I have three children by by marriage, uh, two of whom are fantastic young women. Uh, one in uh, graduate school, and one just about to graduate from from college. And frankly, to them, I didn't become truly relevant until they were applying to college, and I uh, they realized that I had um, only submitted one application to college and got an early action. And after that, I was the font of all knowledge and our relationship went up from there but um, I have a, a you know a fantastic niece and the mother to say flowers that I receive actually come from young women I mentor so I sort of created my family um, part of having created my own uh, firms and nonprofits and uh, sort of I run sort of three different companies and social enterprises but it gives me the flexibility to tend to my tribe on my own terms and I think that um, that's an, that was an important value for me, an important part of my life and who, uh, who I was, who I am and so um, you know I've created a situation where I can really turn things down in September to turn my uh, you know house into Santa's village for the extended um, family because that's really in important to me and so I think you have to find out what's important to you and to create the job situation that serves you rather than feeling that 
you need to sort of put yourself um, into some s situation and apply by those those rules. Um, I guess part of the benefits um, of the education, and I did go to a Stanford event last night just so I could fit in with the rest of this crowd. Um, but uh, I think the the uh, you know my, the, my biggest uh, you know rule of life is that there are no rules. You got to make your own. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I was just thinking, you, you mentioned that you went through five years of fertility treatments, which I imagine was very expensive. What are your yeah. thoughts on companies? I, I'm sure you heard about Facebook and Google paying for yeah. fertility treatments. Do you think that's a, a good idea? I think it's a really exciting development, and it has been landscape changing. Um, I, I had actually made a, a, you know, a comment at some point that... Um, that there should be, you know, a free egg freezing voucher at the Harvard Business School graduation. Yeah. So, uh, to really face the realities of how women can time their their careers and their fertility, it's it's really sort of an, an unspoken until now um, and unappreciated mm -hmm. uh, part. And so, it's a huge resource. And I, I think, you know, thumbs up to the tech community for supporting their employees and the whole people that they are in that way. Yeah, I wish I would have had that opportunity, um, you know, around graduating college. So maybe that's a graduation gift for your stepdaughters. There you go. <laughs> I keep trying to find step, uh, finding uh, um, potential son-in-laws that I really like <laughs> and pitching them to my daughters. Um, they haven't taken me up quite yet, but that's but that's, a, that's, that's, that's a good strategy. Not your stepmom. Um, <laughs> yeah. All right, let's talk about Genentech since Julie and Jennifer, you guys both worked there. Every year Genentech is at the top of all of these lists of greatest places to work, greatest places for women to work, etc. Um, so as insiders or former insiders, what was it about Genentech, the policies or cultural norms that make it such a great place to work and um, what did kind of the men and women do to, to make it uniquely so? Yeah, I, I was there for about five and a half years. Uh, I worked across business development, uh, clinical development, and then marketing. And I think part of what they first had is, I, I think benefit design really matters. And to go back to our point about um, IVF, fertility, they had a long maternity leave. They have a daycare center on site. They have the ability to deliver meals to you on campus that you can sign up for to help you. If you don't have time, you want to spend quality time with your kids, that you don't have to cook. And, and I think that they think holistically about how to enable people to be 100% at work, but also 100% at home when they're home. And that comes in the forms of buses that ensure that you can get there if you're a family and only have one car, you know, if someone else has to drive, there's another way to get to work. They, they have thought about the details of physically getting to work, dealing with kids who, who do get sick during the day. How do you handle that? How do you leave? And there's a culture that it's fairly normal that if you have something come up with your family, you leave. Mm -hmm. and, and people get it. And no one even... You don't get dirty looks. Yeah, and I think that's actually really important in terms of cultural dynamics, which is, mm -hmm. you know, how you respond when someone has an event or has something that comes up that's important to the, to you, and that becomes a cultural norm. Um, the second, I also think, is in the way in which they make decisions, where some people don't like the fact that they have committees and that they have lots of review processes, but I think um, on the flip side, there are group environments in which decisions are made and there is a culture where it is an expectation that you're going to speak up. So um, I think that's important in terms of creating a non-combative communication environment in which people can be successful. Mm -hmm. And third, they actually now in the last six or seven years, I was there when this was instituted, is they're, they're trying to accelerate the development of women, understanding that often women are not given the same opportunities and therefore they're not necessarily going to have checked the same boxes as some of their male counterparts, but they still are equally as qualified. Mm -hmm. And so I think what's important is if someone could be a good national sales manager but say hasn't been a regional sales manager because they've been passed up a couple times before, perhaps by someone who didn't give women the right opportunity, they're still considered if they're considered to be a high potential candidate for the company as a form of commercial leadership in the future. Mm -hmm. I think that's so important, and and that comes from both sides. I've I've counseled a lot of women who feel that if they don't meet all eight criteria on the you know the 
you know, job form that they can't possibly put themselves forward for the job. Um, I'm from the mindset that, you know, sort of like a man, if you can pronounce two of them, you should be given the opportunity to, yeah. to try for the job, you know, and are usually successful if you put the right resources and team around you. Yeah. Make it yeah. Time. And I think there's a lot of support for women at Genentech to do a lot of that internal networking to make that happen. Um, and so people will really out a pathway of view of who you, should, who you should be presenting to, what opportunities sort of need to be put in front of you, so you can kind of make those leaps in your career there. And it was, I think, truly a badge of honor to have a diverse team um, at Genentech. That was something that um, I think the senior leaders all aspired. And I saw it at all levels of the company. Um, the head of our franchise, I was on Rituxin, which was a multi-billion dollar franchise. You know, he had a son and he left every day at 5 o'clock um, to go pick him up from after school activities and it sent a great message to the team. And it wasn't about gender, it was about being a, a workplace um, that worked for everybody. Mm -hmm. Great. All right. Reminding everybody, we're going to um, open it up for questions. So please tweet your questions or uh, put them in the webinar. And we'd love to hear from you. Um, I have one more, too. I don't know if anybody saw <clears throat> a tweet between um, Chrissy Farr and Matthew Holt. So Chrissy Farr is a reporter for um, KQED, and she wrote a really great piece on um, the, the report that we put out on Monday. And um, Matthew Holt responded with something like, uh, it's it hasn't changed. This has always been the way it is. Like, is it? Why is this newsworthy? It's not newsworthy. Um, to which you know, Chrissy responded something along the lines of, "That's exactly why it's newsworthy because it mm -hmm. hasn't changed, and I care about it." Um, <clears throat> what do you guys think of that? I mean, you the the number of women in tech has actually gone down. Um, the number of women in leadership positions in VC has been flat or gone down. Um, in healthcare, is the same thing. Things aren't changing as fast as we want them to, and I think we're we're all pretty optimistic women. And I think we kind of, you know, outwardly talk about things changing, but the numbers say that things haven't right. changed. Um, you, yeah, you only, yeah, you only change what you what you can measure and what you keep measuring and what you hold people accountable for. So without reports like this that really put into um, both qualitative and quantitative and visual graphics, everything but a choreographed dance, interpretive dance for people to understand that, that, that this is still an issue. <laughs> that this is still an issue and that the reports will continue until there is change. It's really important to be um, persistent, you know, being in DC and, and being an advocate for, for so long that, uh, you know, sort of one off. Uh, you know, news reports or Hill Days or commentary on something is not enough unless there's a really sustained effort with um, measurements and scorecards and, and reports like this, we do not see change. That's been the experience. Mm -hmm. Any other thoughts on that? We're, we do have some questions now. Um, <clears throat> After hearing everyone's thoughts, it sounds like this is a group of women that feels like women can have it all. What do you think about the and the number of stories written about this? <clears throat> I, I don't know. I, I don't know if women can have it all, and I don't know if that's necessarily what we should be aspiring to. I think your life sort of ebbs and flows over time. There are yep. times in your life that you focus more on your career, times in your life that you focus more on your family, and you know if you have kids, having backup or a partner or a spouse who's willing to kind of, you know, ebb and flow with you, I think is really important. Um, so I think that's a question that comes up a lot that sort of creates a lot of pressure for women, sort of feeling like every part of their life has to be sort of optimized and aligned. And that's just not the reality for men or women. Um, so yeah, that's not like a goal that I sort of have in mind that I want to sort of have it all. At this time in my life, I'm really focused on my career. And that means there mm -hmm. some things have to give, um, mm -hmm. and sort of structurally, I kind of sort of arrange my life to sort of make it work. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and I, I just want to also go back to like why things haven't changed and like what we can do about it. I, I feel very strongly about this. Um, as someone who is now in the position to help fill C C level roles in companies, I am trying to help leverage with the group of women that are in venture capital to fill those jobs with capable women. And I, I think that it is our obligation among this group to continue to be a very easy, friendly, approachable person that you can 
have your male counterparts come to you at other companies or firms. And I can just say that I heard that other venture firms are hiring. Like I proactively call the partner and say, if you are looking for a candidate and you want a woman, I'd really love you to call me because I get resumes. Yeah. And I, I think that that is the simplest way that we solve this Everybody. problem. Everybody call Julie. Like, <laughs> or call each other. You know, I, I just think that anytime there's a director level position, VP level position, C level position, mm -hmm. yeah, we know we, we know these people. Yeah, like, these are the the women that have been educated, had great jobs, are leaders, are motivated, who want to stay in the game, mm -hmm. and and it's up to us. And so. I, I try not to fall prey to the stereotypes of what leaders should look like, and I think that we all are biased by that in the media, and who we see is the examples of leaders of big tech companies, and I think we just have to continue to challenge ourselves. Great. All right. We had a, a good question from Shreya Iyer on Twitter, and she says, how do you guys make yourself heard if you're an organization when most of the decisions happen in clicks that you are not part of? Anybody have an experience like this? Yeah, <laughs> um, I I would say that I um, I think that finding an appropriate way to socialize and become friends with people is is harder than it looks. Mm -hmm. um, most of the people that are VCs are men with families, with wives, with kids that live in the same area that I do, and often people socialize by having drinks after work. Yeah. I have to think about how to create an environment that they get to know me in a social dynamic and in an environment that also just doesn't put them in an awkward position. So I have a lot of breakfasts. I mean, a lot of breakfasts. I have group get-togethers where it is me and I organize it, I'm proactive, and I, I try and get things that happen between 4 and, you know, 4 and 7 p.m. and then we all leave. Um, I, I try to make an environment that works and I think that helps to get into those clicks, and I think that if you even have one person of your relationship with, um, that even if there's a clicky environment that you can rely on getting the information after the fact, that's good enough for me. Mm -hmm. Right, I think I think recognizing that there are those clicks. It was really one of the most important lessons that I learned, and one of the things that was really important for me to pass on to my daughters that there's the meeting before the meeting. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so many of my friends have walked in and like it seemed like the decision was already made by the time we got into the what was supposed to be, you know, the open forum, the board meeting, or or what have you. And I was like, well, that's because there was the meeting before the meeting with the clicks and being able to understand the, the dynamics that this is even happening is the first step to then being able to find, as Julie said, finding that champion perhaps within those who would either open the door for you or feed you information from. But being able to understand that oft, so often the decisions are made in the meeting before the meeting is really one of the most essential points to, to success in, in navigating in these environments. Awesome. Uh, you, any, we have two minutes, so we're actually like running out of time, which makes me really sad. I wish this was a longer webinar. We'll have to do it again. Um, but as a wrap-up, I would like for each of you guys to kind of share one piece of advice that you've received either personally or professionally uh, with those on the webinar. I think the best personal advice I got was actually from my dad, and he said you can figure out who your real supporters are by the people who are enthusiastic for you when things are good. Um, because sometimes when things aren't going great, lots of people want to come in and sort of help you out. But when things are great, sort of the people who are truly supportive and happy for you are the people who are really going to be there sort of as part of your true sort of internal personal and professional network in the long term. Oh, interesting. I would think it'd be the other way around. Like, it's easy to mm -hmm. champion someone who's doing well, but then when they're down, if you're going to help them. Yeah, you know, I think it's sort of about um, making sure that the people in your circle don't feel competitive with you, right? That um, they want to see you do great. And so that's sort of the best way to filter that out is when, when things are doing great, who's really backing you up. Yeah. My key piece of advice uh, that I carry with me is from a... Uh, Dr. Frida Lewis Hall, the Chief Medical Officer of Pfizer, who is just fantastic. And she just says very succinctly, do you. 
And I think that, you know, in this environment where we're trying to think, you know, do we need to be more like men? Do we mean, need more like, you know, Caucasian men? Do we need to be, I'm neither old nor white nor Caucasian or uh, any of these other things. And so um, just holding on, you know, inside and just doing me. And then that's enough. And in fact, that that's like super um, is really what carries me through so many situations. And I think if everybody just sort of does them and finds their best self and puts that out into the world, that we'd be a better place. I like that. Julie, last word. Uh, I, I would say um, try and get mentors or relationships with people who have the ability to place you into executive jobs or control capital. I, I don't mean that just to be self-serving. I just mean that it, it is important to understand who has the power to put you into a great job and, um, and, and really finding a way to get access to those people because You'll shine. You just you will. Just keep trying because eventually they will get you a great role that will just rocket ship your career. Awesome. Great. You guys are so inspiring. Thank you so much for taking the time today and for everyone out there for your great questions and attending today. Uh, I will just leave it with be you. Thank you. Thank Bye. you. Bye. Thanks. <laughs>